Welcome to ECE 165. This is the fourth and final lecture on sequential logic. So what we'd like to focus on today is a topic called asynchronous inputs. So what do we mean by this? Well, we mean that you know if, if something is synchronous, it is synchronous to a clock. But when I go and type on my laptop or press you know, the screen on my phone, I don't know what the phase of the clock is. I can't guarantee that I'm pressing it you know, in relation to some uh, phase of, of, of the clock on this chip. And in fact, that'd be pretty impossible when the clock period is you know, gigahertz or something like this. So as one example, let's discuss a button press. There are many other forms of asynchronous inputs that one might encounter. Uh, but a button press is perhaps the e more easily uh, understood, uh, you know, one of this. Okay, so oftentimes a button looks something like this. We have a resistor that's pulling the the logic button up high. We have a button. If the button is pressed, it basically causes a short circuit uh, and drops the value here low, and it goes through. Let's say it's it's tied to a flip flop here. This is D and this is output Q here. So the question is, what happens if this button press occurs during the setup hold aperture of this flip-flop? Okay, so let's take a, a nice zoom in of the clock period here. And let's say that, you know, this is, you know, the center of the rising edge. Let's say that we needed to have our circuit set up, some T set up before the rising edge of the clock. And we needed to hold the value some T hold after the rising edge of the clock. Now, we again, we did say when we studied flip-flops design that it's possible that hold time might be negative, but for this example, let's assume that hold time is positive. So the question is, what happens to the output if D transitions somewhere in the middle here? We know it's what happens to the behavior of this flip-flop if, if D transitions outside of the setup hold aperture. But in this case, frankly, we have no idea what's going to happen here. Okay, it could be one or zero, could be somewhere in the middle, hard to say. Okay, so the question is, what happens here? That's the topic of, of today's lecture. Okay, so to try and understand this, let's recall the static flip-flop model. We're assuming in this case that we're dealing with a static flip-flop, not a dynamic flip-flop. So if you recall, this was, well, basically two back-to-back -back inverters in positive feedback. And if you recall, we ended up drawing this uh, voltage transfer curve that looked something like that. And then we had this opposite voltage transfer curve and we had these different stable operating points. We had A, we had B, and we had this weird point in the middle called the metastable point C, okay? So if we happen to have an input transition during the setup hold aperture, in this case, Well, one of three things can happen. We will land at either A, B, or C. These are the only stable or perhaps metastable operating points in our system. So one problem, there are, I, I guess, two main problems that we have here. One problem is that We don't know what state it will be. Very, very difficult to accurately predict this. It's, uh, it's not totally random, but it's nearly random. Okay. Now, if it lands at A or B, our system is okay. These are valid logic levels, um, though 
there's a 50% chance it was the wrong logic level or the wrong state. That's very possible. Okay, so what about metastable point C? Well, this is problematic, right? We really don't want to land on metastable point C because first of all, this is not a valid logic level, right? So, so this is you know, perhaps at VDD over two. If this is the input into some other you know, combinational logic at VDD over two, it's possible we could introduce a very large short circuit current condition where you have a cascade of a whole bunch of gates that are all on, all shorting circuit from VDD through ground. Okay, so that's a disastrous scenario if that were to happen. Um, and then, you know, frankly, we just we just can't predict what's going to happen to the logic after that. Okay, so what we need is some way to model this. If we do end up in metastable point C, we have to figure out with with reasonable degree of accuracy how long are we actually going to be here, and is this going to affect our circuit in a negative way or not? So if the circuit really does land at metastable point C, it's technically possible that it could stay there indefinitely, which would of course be disastrous for our system. Um, but in practice, uh, that metastable point is, you know, we call it metastable because it's not exactly stable. It's like having a ball at the, at the top of a mountain, uh, you know, that's very, very, very top, a very spiky mountain. And, you know, even a tiny little gust of wind will push it down and it'll go to either state A or B. So what we'd like to do is perhaps try and model this positive feedback circuit and try and predict if we were to land at point C, how quickly would we resolve back to point A or point B? Okay, so we can model uh, the feedback circuit as a small signal Uh, gain with delay. Okay, so yes, this is a digital design class, but uh, we will be using just a little bit of analog circuit stuff here in order to do our model. So we say here that the positive feedback circuit is basically, you know, some gain element G uh, with an output impedance that is driving um, through feedback back to itself here. Okay, so we say this is signal A of T, this is loaded with a capacitor C, and this is R. Okay, so assume that A at T equals zero is equal to Vm, this is our metastable voltage, plus some initial condition, A zero. Okay, so this is Vm is um, our metastable voltage, or in other words, i.e. point C. Okay, so uh, we can then set up a differential equation. I'm not going to derive or solve that here. If you want more details, I suggest you read the textbook. Uh, but let's just say we solve a differential equation, and we get A of T is equal to A0 e to the T over tau s, where tau s is equal to rc over g minus 1. Okay, so in order for the circuit to exit the metastable region, we say that uh, thus we require g to be greater than 1 to exit metastability. Okay, very good. So we require G greater than one to exit metastability, but how much time does this require? That's going to be, uh, you know, what we'd like to try and uh, model here. So the time 
required to exit metastability How long does it take to get away from point C and back towards point A or B? Uh, or in other words, um, such that A of T gets larger than delta V to, to get to a valid logic level. Okay, so this is what we'd want to try and model. So we say T dq is equal to tau s times the natural log of delta v, whatever voltage we set to say that, okay, we're outside of a, or we're into a valid logic level, minus natural log of a0. Okay, so what this means is that, note, that if the initial condition as a0 approaches zero, or in other words, the difference between the precise metastable voltage Vm and, and the actual voltage we're at is zero, then we say that the delay from D to Q to register a valid logic level becomes infinity. Okay, so, And that's in line with, with our intuition. So we said, if we are at precisely the metastable point, then it's possible we could stay there indefinitely. Okay, um, obviously that's not desired, but it's possible. So as it usually is the case, let's go ahead and look at an example to try and understand what this uh, is, is trying to describe. And I, I, you know, I get it, it's a little complicated to, to, to think about, but let's just go through this quick example. So let's imagine that our clock goes high here. Okay, and then it goes down and you know, so on and so forth. So this is our clock signal. Now what I'd like to do is let's look at what happens to the output. This is these x axes are time, by the way. Let's look at what happens to the output if D transitions, and let me just draw a vertical line here. So the nominal D transition, in the worst case, when it just directly goes through the center of this set up hold aperture is as follows, okay? So what I'd like to do is let's look at D if it were to transition a little earlier than this. And if it were to transition a little later than this. Okay, so this is the range of transitions of D. Now, uh, oh, sorry, let me label this as D. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at what would happen at the output Q under these transitions. Okay, so for this first transition, after a propagation delay, Q is basically just going to go up and, you know, it's, it's going to latch itself in nicely. So these are Qs. Okay, as D gets closer to the setup and hold aperture, it's going to take a little bit longer time to get up there. Okay, uh, and let me just perhaps extend this a little bit further here. So again, as D gets a little closer to that setup hold aperture, it's going to take longer and longer to, to settle. At some point, it's just not going to settle and it's just going to stick there. That's if we had precisely Vm uh, where A0 is equal to 0. Okay. Um, and then likewise, as we start to exit past the setup hold aperture, you know, it's going to take a long time and eventually it'll... It's just not registering the correct valid logic level and eventually just, you know, stays zero here. Okay, so the problem is right here. So problem is this could take a long time to resolve. All right, this is what we want to try and address when we go ahead and design a circuit that's going to you know, help us with this mess. So entering mess metastability can be very problematic. We definitely don't want this invalid logic level to propagate through our circuits and so on. So the solution to this is what we call a synchronizer.
Okay, so we have an asynchronous input coming into our flip-flops. We need to synchronize it so that it's, well, synchronous with our flip-flops. Okay, so the problem is we have input D coming into a flip-flop, and input D is asynchronous with respect to this clock. Okay, and that, this is a flip-flop, just to be clear. And that creates an output X that could potentially have some metastability involved with it. So the idea with the synchronizer is, well, it's you're going to laugh at how simple it is. Well, just put another flip-flop right after it, okay? And then this creates output Q. Okay, so the idea here is if X goes metastable, then hopefully it exits the metastable region before it hits the next flip-flop. And if we can do so, then output Q, which then goes to the rest of our system through our combinational logic and so on, will be at least a valid logic level. And it may not be the correct valid logic level, at which point we may need to do some oversampling or some polling or something like this in order to infer what the, the right logic level is. But at least it won't be this weird invalid logic level. So the timing diagram of what this looks like is shown um, here. So we have clock. Clock goes up here high for a little while, then it goes down, then it goes back up over here. Okay, so the idea here is with x, node x here, we don't quite know what node x is at the start of this little experiment, but then let's say input D transitions during the setup hold aperture of this first flip-flop, and so we enter the metastable point that I'm going to denote as VDD over two point, okay? Now, as long as we eventually exit this metastable point, a setup time before the next rising edge of the clock, um, then output Q should hopefully then be a valid logic level. Again, we don't know what level it will be, but it will hopefully be a valid logic level. So the idea here is that this distance here is what we call T meta, the metastable time. And then as long as we have enough setup time left, setup, then of course we also have a uh, T propagation clock to Q, TPCQ. So here, we hope that T meta is less than the clock period minus t setup. And if it is, then we say that the metastable time resolves basically in time for our circuit to finalize what it's trying to, uh, to, to capture a valid logic level. So how does this work in practice? Let's do a quick um, calculation. So uh, example, so given, let's say we have n asynchronous events, uh, or rather asynchronous input changes, to be a little bit more precise, uh, at node D per second. Then we say that the errors per second can be given by N times T naught over TC times e to the minus tc, the clock period, minus t setup, divided by tau s, okay, where t naught over tc is approximately equal to the probability of an input change during the setup hold aperture, which is something that would obviously invoke this metastable point, okay? So we can model our errors per second with this formula. Again, I'm not deriving how this formula I, I came about. If you're interested, I, I suggest you read the book. So, you know, the point here is I'm just trying to make an example of uh, approximate numbers. So the mean time between failure just write that down, the mean time between 
uh, failures is equal to one over the errors per second. This thing that we just derived. Okay, so the mean time between failure turns out to be a metric that people in the industry like to cite when they're talking about their products. Okay, so let's go through an example. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to use an older technology, but uh, the, the I, th I think the uh, numbers are uh, reasonable for understanding purposes. So let's say in, in 0.25 micron, a flip-flop has tau s of 20 picoseconds, TO equals to 15 picoseconds, and let's just say uh, for fun that T setup is about zero. Okay, so given N equals 50 megahertz, so there's N asynchronous events per sec, uh, yeah, N asynchronous events per second, or rather, 50 million asynchronous events per second, which is reasonable. You know, no one's pressing a button 50 million times a second. But uh, if you have a, you know, a cable, a USB cable, for example, that's connecting to your computer and it happens to not have an asynch uh, synchronous clock to your system, you know, something like this could happen. So given n equals 50 megahertz, what is the maximum frequency we could clock our synchronizer? for a mean time between failure greater than 1,000 years. Okay, and so you might be laughing like 1,000 years, that seems a little excessive here, right? Well, if you are designing an automobile, a medical implant, you know, pacemaker, something like this, you do not want someone to press the brakes or try to pace someone's heart and have failures happen. Right. If you have, if that happens, and they can identify that it was your chip that made the mistake, you know, lawsuits and you know, so on, uh, loss of life is devastating. Right. So we as engineers want to be very conservative and make sure that you know it's not going to be one of these um, asynchronous events causing metastability that's going to cause a failure of our circuit. All right. So how do we calculate this? Well, 1,000 years um, turns out is approximately equal to pi times 10 to the 11 seconds. Okay, so next time you're playing Trivial Pursuit, you know that. Uh, so this then we set equal to our formula is equal to C TC over N T naught E to the TC minus T setup over tau S. Uh, we can solve for TC and we do so TC equals 760 picoseconds. And so therefore, F max, the maximum we can clock the circuit at would be 1.3 gigahertz. So that's pretty good, right? Um, it, it turns out that these metastable points end up usually resolving pretty quickly. Uh, and so as a result, the design of these synchronizers, at least in terms of specifications, isn't that difficult. Now, it turns out that synchronizers are notoriously easy to mess up. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the, the textbook uh, goes into a lot of detail about how synchronizers can be easily messed up and so on. So just be careful when you're designing these. But I guess the bottom line is by putting you know two flip-flops in a line, the chances that the output Q of this circuit will still be in the metastable point, um, or rather output X does not resolve its metastability uh, condition before the next rising edge of the clock, is super low, provided that our clock frequency is is reasonably slow. In this particular example, in 0.25 micron, which is an ancient technology, we're calculating a 1.3 gigahertz clock frequency. So this is very, very reasonable. All right, so now what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about a few other miscellaneous circuits and techniques that we might want to know as we wrap up our discussion on sequential logic. Now, one of the things I wanted to, to talk about now is a technique that allows us to build pulses, okay? Specifically uh, for the pulsed latch method of synchronization or of uh, sequential logic, but this could be used anywhere that you need to generate pulses. So how to generate uh, pulses, okay? So it turns out it's actually fairly easy 
how to generate pulses, and it's kind of a cool circuit. Uh, so let's take uh, you know some clock signal, call it phi, and what we want to do is we want to generate a short, very small duty cycle version of this pulse called perhaps phi p. Okay, so the idea here is we can just take this output, or sorry, this clock signal, and delay it. Okay, specifically, you know, add an odd number of inverters and use that as the other input into this AND, or NAND gate, rather. Okay, so as long as this is a odd number of inverters, this circuit will work. Okay, so let's uh, just draw a little timing diagram to understand how this circuit would work. So let's imagine our clock signal looks something like this. Something like that. So let's go ahead and look at node X. Okay, we'll call it this, this node after these delays. So X is just going to be an inverted and delayed version of phi. So we can just go ahead and directly draw that out here. Look something like this. Okay, so there is a, I guess, a clock to X delay here. So the output of this circuit phi P, this pulsed output, is going to be the NAND of both of these circuits. Okay, um, and oh, I guess I uh, forgot, I should also have an inverter because I actually want this to be an AND function. So phi P is there. Okay, so it's the AND of phi and X, uh, which is only true for short periods of time as follows. Okay, so that's a very simple way to generate a nice pulse signal. So another topic I wanted to uh, discuss is combining logic and latches and flip-flops. Okay, so we already kind of introduced this a little bit when we talked about set and reset latches and flip-flops. Now in, in that and in this uh, topic here, we can say some of the inverters in latches and flip-flops can be replaced with logic. reducing sequencing overhead. Okay, so that's a nice possibility here, right? So for example, we could have, and I'll draw a latch, I suppose. We could have a latch where instead of having just a D input, we can have two inputs, A and B, and they go into a NOR gate which then goes into a transmission gate, clock and clock bar below here. And then maybe even we have another uh, gate underneath here. Maybe it's a NAND gate. And, you know, just as an example, maybe it's a three input NAND gate, C, D, and E. And this goes into a transmission gate, clock bar, down here and clock up here, not to be confused with clock bar uh, from the upper gate there. And then maybe we take these inputs into a NAND gate. Again, it's just drawn this way for bubble pushing purposes. And this creates output Q. Okay, so this is just an example where if you happen to need to do very specific computation in your sequential logic, you can build that uh, a computation directly into your latches or flip-flops. Now this is showing for a, a dynamic latch here, but you know you could imagine how you do this for a static flip-flop even. Now I do have to say this is not very popular. Not because it's not a good idea. In fact, it's a great idea if you can combine some of these logic functions into your latches and flip-flops, you definitely will save propagation delays and your circuit will be faster. However,
these basically requires full custom design. So, so I, I'll say not very popular except in full custom design, simply because, you know, when we have our standard cell library, we tend to have, you know, a small collection of D flip flops. None of them necessarily have the right kind of logic that we need built into them. And so we don't usually have exactly the right logic function in our latches or flip flops that we're trying to use. And so as a result, you typically would have to custom build these. Uh, and that's just not super popular. Uh, we tend to prefer, prefer to just use the standard D flip flops in the standard cell library to speed up the design process. So the last major topic I wanted to talk about within the context of sequential logic design, and of course there's so many other things that we could talk about, but we just don't have time to talk about everything, uh, is a topic called true single phase clock. Or TSPC latches and flip-flops. And the reason I want to talk about this as it turns out we actually use TSPC latches and flip-flops a lot actually in full custom design particularly when we're build, building high speed and low power clock dividers. This is often needed in phase lock loops and RF circuits and so on. So this is actually a very relevant topic um, beyond just basic digital design. So the motivation for this topic is that conventional uh, flip-flops require complementary clocks and as a result they have a lot of clocked transistors a lot of clocked transistors so, for example, there's eight clocked transistors in the quote unquote robust flip flop that we studied earlier. Okay, um, so but what we mean by complementary clocks is we need clock and clock bar carried around the whole flip flop. All right, so that has extra overhead, you have to have extra inverters and so on. This delays things, makes things bigger uh, and higher power. So true single phase clock or TSPC latches and flip flops only use a single clock phase as the name implies. So what that means is we only need clock, we don't need clock bar, okay? So let's try and understand this with an example. Let's look at a latch specifically. We'll look at a latch first and then we'll look at a flip-flop next. Okay, so the latch looks something like this. We have our PMOS device on top. Then we go to an NMOS device followed by another NMOS device. Okay, so this is one, I guess, if you will, stage of logic. We have the D connected here. This is input D. So, so this N, PMOS and NMOS combo basically act as an inverter. Then we have this additional NMOS that acts as a clock terminal. We take the output of this guy and connect it to another uh, set of gates, or another gate rather, that has a PMOS transistor and again, another NMOS, NMOS transistor pair here. Okay, looks something like this. And again, this guy is clocked here and we've output Q here. So this is Q, this is X. We'll use node X uh, in our subsequent analysis. Okay, so this circuit looks a little funky let's try and understand how it works. All right, um, so first we have, uh, let's draw a timing diagram. We'll draw a phi and we'll say it's low and then it goes high. And we wanna try and understand 
how this circuit works. So let's draw down, drop down an edge here. And let's furthermore say that input D does you know, something funky. It goes up here and then back down and then up here and then back down just to see what the behavior of the circuit will look like. So now let's look at node X. Okay, so when clock is low, the NMOS transistor in this first stage of logic is off. So this circuit can't pull down. And so therefore, it's going to be in the, the uh, pre-charge mode, basically, right? So this, this when, uh, or sorry, in the hold mode, okay? And what we mean by that is that the pull-down network can never turn on. The pull-up network can turn on. It depends what the value of D is, okay? Uh, but we can never pull down, okay? So we are in the hold mode. So in this case, D happened to be zero at the start of this example, and so we're just holding here. Okay, so this is what we'd call the hold mode. Okay, now as soon as phi goes high, all of a sudden this NMOS transistor in the pull down network allows X to be pulled down. Okay, uh, and so this would be in the evaluate phase now. This is basically just working like an inverter now. Okay, so basically, you know, when D toggles, you know, X will move up and down. Okay, so we call this the um, evaluate mode of this circuit. Okay, and likewise, a similar thing happens to output Q. Okay, so in this particular case, X is high coming into this out uh, into the second stage of logic. And so we are in the hold mode, but the PMOS transistor hasn't turned on. So in this case, we don't know if Q is high or low. Let's just draw it as both. Okay. And then we say that phi goes high. And so the pull down network can turn on. And this second stage of logic just basically acts as an inverter in this case. So it's inverting node X. So it's zero, it's one, zero and so on. So again, this is the evaluate phase. Now what's the advantage of this circuit? The circuit only has two clocked transistors. That's a very small number. Um, in addition, it only has four extra transistors. There's six transistors total for this whole circuit. There's no extra inverters needed to generate the inverted clock and so on. This is a very small, very compact and very low power circuit. This is why it's popular in certain applications. So let's le now look at the design of a TSPC flip-flop. Okay, so the design is going to be based on the similar design principle, uh, master-slave configuration and, and so on. But the circuit will look a little surprising uh, to you perhaps. So again, we have our NMOS at the top here, PMOS, or sorry, not NMOS at the top, a PMOS at the top. But interestingly, we're actually gonna have a second PMOS here instead of a second NMOS. Okay, so again, the inputs will be connected to form an inverter-like circuit, but now we have a PMOS here that's clocked by this clock signal. We actually take the output of this circuit here. This goes into a second stage of logic. Again, has three transistors. Uh, in this case, it's the more normal uh, type of circuit with a slight change, we have clock signal phi going to the top and bottom transistors here, okay? And then the output of this guy then goes to another stage of logic. Like so. Uh, and this basically becomes our usual TSPC gate here. So we have phi and then this goes here and over here, and this creates output Q. Okay, so interestingly, in this case, we say that, um, or you know, I, I, it works in the same uh, sort of way. We have a master-slave configuration. The first latch is in the transparent mode, while the second latch is in the hold mode, and so on. 
I'm not actually going to step through the timing diagram for this. I think you know we've done that sort of exercise enough. Uh, I do leave it as a nice exercise to uh, to the the viewer here uh, to do this and make sure that you do understand the timing to go through a few examples. But the nice uh, benefit of this circuit is that there are only four clocked transistors. This is a huge benefit over the previous um, design of our robust uh, flip-flop. This is a significant reduction. In addition, we don't have to generate the inverted clock signal. Okay, so no inverters required to generate a phi bar, a clock bar. So this is really good. It's very compact, very low power, etc. However, this is a dynamic circuit. It's not a static circuit, so it's not nearly so robust as our quote unquote robust flip flop. As a result, we are susceptible to charge sharing We are susceptible to interference. And it's actually very delicate with regard to sizing and the edges of the clock. In particular, I want to write that down and requires sharp clock edges. Okay, so if you're going to design a, a TSPC flip-flop, just be very careful of that. Make sure you simulate across corners with process variation, across temperature, and so on. This, These circuits are notoriously difficult to get super reliable, um, and so make sure you do a good job simulating them. But because of their advantages, these actually are used. Uh, they're often used in ultra high speed designs. So as I mentioned, I've used these uh, in a lot of the projects uh, in, in my research group when we're building a high-speed clock divider in particular. This is useful for phase lock loops, uh, RF um, circuits, and so on. Um, or even you know, if you're building a very high-speed logic uh, as, a, as a digital circuit, uh, this is a useful way to, to build your high-speed flip-flops, as long as you're aware of the uh, difficulties of, of the circuit as well. And uh, that should actually be Q bar, not Q. So if you're going for the fastest possible design, you might be choosing TSPC uh, for that. And then we can also do some other things like combining logic into TSPC latches. Okay, so the basic idea, and of course this is extensible to flip-flops as well. Uh, we'll just talk about it in, in, in terms of latches, just to be simple. So the basic idea here is if you're building a TSPC cell, you have a pull-up network. You have a clocked NMOS transistor here, and then you have a pull-down network, right? Uh, we were just implementing inverters in our most basic instantiations of this, but there's nothing that says we can't also build this to be generic pull up and pull down network. So this might be multi-bit inputs into here. So we can compute a logic function here and then take these results into the next stage of the TSPC latch, which might look something like this. This is the clock signal phi here. And then this goes into the next stage of that latch. And this is output Q. Okay, so just as a simple example, let's do an AND gate, or a rather more specifically an AND latch. Okay, so the idea here is we take our pull up network, just like we would do in a normal static complementary CMOS design process. PMOS is calculating A and B. Take this down, 
through our clocked NMOS transistor, and then we have a stack with A and B for the inputs here. So this is A, B, and this is our clock phi here. Then we take this as our output into our second stage of logic. It looks something like this. Again, this is the clock signal phi, and this goes in here as follows. So this is output Q, but now is Q is the AND operation of A and B into this latch. So again, if you're building TSPC logic, you're typically doing it because you're very concerned about speed or possibly area, that might be another concern. But if you're concerned about speed, then you might also want to consider incorporating a little bit of logic into these uh, latches and flip-flops as a way to further increase the, the speed of operation of your devices, right? Otherwise, you have the stage of logic in this latch that is not contributing any useful logic function other than providing timing. This is the sequencing overhead that we've talked about. But if we can kind of eat into the sequencing overhead by providing some functionality, it makes it kind of less painful uh, to have to do this. All right. So for the very fastest designs, uh, this is a very nice approach to do this, actually.